The recording is starting. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to our keynote. I'm going to turn it over to Julia. Context. 
So how can we work together to benefit both researchers and practitioners? So when you think about open source, um, I heard a lot of talk about code today, a lot of talk about commits, a lot of talk about um, repositories. And open source is that, yes, but it's so much more. It's this complex, multi-level ecosystem of human contributors who happen to come together to build something. And they contribute in many different ways. They may contribute code, they may contribute developer experience expertise, accessibility testing, community um, management, etc. But it's also this living, breathing organism that changes over time. And we really need to make sure that we're accounting for that change when we're looking into the ecosystem themselves or the ecosystems as proxies for other problems. It is a very attractive research space because of how data rich it is. Lemire has used GitHub or GHTorrent as a data set. Really? It, right, it was renamed GHR Archive. GitHub Archive. Yes. Um, so even though we have all of this data, we have to make sure that we're taking it into consideration that it is not complete in any way, shape, or form. And it's exciting for researchers because there's so much data, but that data oftentimes comes without caveats. So it can give you a limited snapshot of an ecosystem at a point in time, but it doesn't give you full understanding. So when we do refer to open source, we're referring not just to the collection of repositories, but also the community involved, their interactions, incentives, behavioral norms, culture. And there are many open source ecosystems. And one of the big mistakes that we tend to make, both as practitioners and researchers, is referring to open source as one ecosystem. So let's talk about some best practices and how things can and have gone wrong in the past. So we heard a lot about data. Wonder why? It's like this this entire day is focused on data or something. Um, the panel was really insightful, and I'm going to touch on some of those themes in this section as well. But at the heart of all open source ecosystems are the humans involved. We hear this in various spots over the course of many, many years that open source is people. Open source would not be here without people. The production of open source software reflects social activity and labor of a group of individuals working towards, hopefully, a shared goal. If they're not working towards a shared goal, I think that's where flogging comes in. So. But because we're talking about humans, all the data associated with open source gets human, it's involving human subjects. And we need to treat that with the care and respect that it deserves. Scraping does not exempt you from dealing with human subjects because they're still implicated in the data collected. So, the one guiding principle is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, I believe Jen Goldblum said something to this about uh, way back when, like in the 90s or something. Um, and we hear a lot that open source is public. All the data is, is out there. And 
Yes, those repositories are public. It's part of what makes it both such a fantastic place to work, as well as an attractive place for the research problems. But just because it's public doesn't mean it's ethical. And I'm delighted to have heard so much about consent during the day here. Um, community consent is critical when working with public data. And there's a real possibility and probability to cause harm to the humans in open source by using data in ways that they didn't intend. Some of these papers may not have crossed um, everyone's radar, but we've seen people, we've seen researchers use uh, commit data, for instance, to assess productivity. And what productivity should look like or could look like. What is the optimal productivity for uh, a software engineer? And in, a, in some places, we've seen that implemented to the detriment of people who don't necessarily follow the normal pattern of commits, who have different behavioral patterns. We've also seen people analyze commit messages to get a, to get a glimpse into mental health. And if you analyze my commit messages, <laughs> it might give you a good view of my mental health, but not what I want you to have. Um, and some analysis like that can actually be seen as a betrayal of trust. It can make <coughs> open source and the people within it less authentic. If I get a bot that says, hey, Julia, stop beating on yourself. This was your first commit. It was just a typo. I'm not going to be really enthusiastic about committing with abandon, right? So we want to make sure that when we're doing research and when we're cooperating with researchers, that we are still keeping an environment where people feel comfortable being themselves and continuing what has made open source such a powerful force in the world. So when scoping research questions, keep in mind it's not just code. We do over-index on code and their related artifacts because it's easy. But we're not afraid of hard problems. This is Linux, we know this. I just gotta throw that one in there. Um, but making sure that we understand the socio-element of a socio-technical system helps us figure out where we are missing information, where we are missing opportunities to collaborate with each other. And it helps us remember that the people involved in the system, the people behind the data, deserve to be treated with care and respect. That's my favorite catch-all, research best practices. So we are in this weird spot where we've got a massive wealth of data. We've got cheap computing power. We've got cheap storage. It's, it, it's like you're a kid in a candy store, right? You, you can do so much with what we have available to us. But understanding the context of the systems is important to really understanding the system as a whole. And the best way to do this is to really ask, and I understand that time is valuable, but in order to have valid outputs to your research, consent is key. And community members are often subject matter experts in their sub-ecosystem. They have knowledge and lived experience from their days, months, years, decades working within that ecosystem. 
So it's like collaborating together in the spirit of open source, we can better help each other understand the parameters of the system involved. So I, I loved the mention earlier at the note of non-incompatible purpose. Did I get that correct? Okay. Non-incompatible purpose. Um, so that is that was a phrase that was new to me today. I love it. Um, and I have a similar one, which was put forth uh, by Dr. Nissenbaum, the idea of contextual integrity. And it's the idea that protection of privacy is tied to the norms of specific contexts in which the information was gathered. Dr. Nissenbaum wrote a central tenet of contextual integrity is that there are no arenas of life not governed by norms of information flow. No information or spheres of life for which anything goes. And so in 2016, talking about my confusion with GH Short and GitHub Archive, um, a GitHub user posted a comment on the repository for GH Torrent saying, can you please take my email addresses out of this data set? Because it used to have everybody's git commit email addresses in it. This is very useful for a number of reasons. Um, but they pointed out that there's a big difference between people browsing profile and decided to ping them, presumably about their work, and getting spammed, essentially, by researchers because they've got this one data set that they're going to use, and they're certain that they're the only person that has thought of doing this. And eventually, email addresses were redacted from that data. It took a lot of doing. Um, it, was, it was not a, a light effort um, on the maintainer's part, but <coughs> there was enough justification that this was important. So bringing it back to contextual integrity, this use of their email address violated contextual integrity in which that email address was given. Similarly, my self-deprecating commit messages, I didn't volunteer those for behavioral analysis. I volunteered those for my own personal, like, hey, maybe you turn on spell check next time. Yes. So we can't use what well, the data is already public as this convenient phrase to circumvent ethical issues. And that's part of why openness isn't necessarily a good in and of itself, as much as I would like it to be. But we have to keep in mind that the ways in which information is disclosed can be very easily reverse engineered to identify a particular person. It can violate trust. It can make practitioners less inclined to collaborate with researchers in the future. And it can increase the schism between research and practice. And I think that's really a shame. So we do need to strive for a balance between openness, ethics, and privacy. And we need to do so in consultation with the community we study. And we need to keep in mind that even within a community, it's not a monolith. Which feeds nicely into respect and equity. We need research open source ecosystems for researching people. But when we look at the data that we do have, 
research about the software is far or data about the software is far more readily available than data about the people for a number of reasons. But given that, we need to take care not to exacerbate or reinforce inequalities in the existing system by failing to question what is absent from the data we have. We have tons of commit messages. I'm just going to keep saying commit messages. Apparently, it's a fun phrase. Um, but we don't have a lot of data about activities that aren't captured by GitHub or your source control system, which are the ones you really choose to use. And when we over index on the data that we have, we are inherently placing a value judgment, saying this is more important than the data that we don't have. In 2017, um, Lawson published a blog post saying, I've already told my partner that if and when we decide to start having kids, I'll probably quit open source for good. I just can't see how I'll be able to make the time for doing both. There's been plenty of research done into who contributes to open source and why and what benefits they see from it. And these benefits are not insignificant. Who here has a job in part because of open source? Okay. So that's direct employment. <laughs> you can get direct compensation, you can be sponsored, and you can have, you can build a business on open source. Um, so the benefits that we do see people receiving from their work with open source can be quite, quite large. And for the people who don't receive compensation for their work, they're dedicating their free time. So they're actually paying to work in open source. That payment is currency. The currency is time, but they're paying to do so. In 2019, there was a great paper um, by Miller et al. and on the link at the end. The study was um, why do contributors give up flossing? Which I kind of just love from a pun perspective. <laughs> but the, the thrust of it was that for all contributors, occupational reasons, such as major life changes, were the most cited for leaving open source, significantly more than lacking peer support or losing interest that are much more commonly discussed in the literature. So one of the other best practices that we have is assume that the economic incentives and the availability of people who keep the lights on are not evenly distributed. One of the papers that I am dying to see, please somebody, again, just throw this on my free dissertation idea pile, I want to read the paper of why people never start flossing. It's not dentists, I promise. But when you're not getting paid to work in open source, you are choosing to spend your free time on it. And if you don't have that free time, that can impact your presence in the data that feeds into recruiters looking for people qualified for jobs, which feeds into your long-term employment potential. There are so, there are so many downstream effects. And so I want to see that paper. I want to see why people never start contributing to open source. But that's the data. Yes. So I think by now we know that open source is part of pretty much everything. As 
it's used in everything from space exploration to social networks to that very scary device that I have implanted in my head once. Um, does not go through IRB approval for any sort of like checking. But every single person on the planet is affected by open source software, whether they know it or not. The water treatment plant that they get the water from uses open source software. The system that evaluates whether you're eligible for benefits needs open source software. And this became really apparent when in 2011, or 2021 actually, there was a paper that had been retracted. So you may have caught this in the news, it made quite a few rounds, where researchers submitted known flaws to the Lennox kernel. They had no intention of allowing them to emerge upstream. But it, it made some like headlines here and there. Uh, and Greg Scott said, these researchers crossed a line they shouldn't cross. Nobody asked them to do this. And a lot of people wasted a whole lot of time. And time is currency. Now, to their credit, this research was designed to have no side effects. But they over-indexed on the software and not on the socio-technical system. If they had considered that they were essentially running experiments on people, not on software, their approach might have changed. They might have said, hey, maybe we should send this to an IRB for review. Or maybe we should not do this. Um, but we have an entire university banned from contributing to the Linux kernel. I don't know if that ban is ever going to expire. Hopefully at some point, maybe. So if you are doing experiments in open source, regardless if the root is technical or not, you're running human experiments. And it might impact the world's ecosystems and infrastructure in unknown and immeasurable ways. It's hard to know the scope when you're talking about open source. You don't know who is using a library if they aren't also open source. Even small changes to one part can be what breaks a mission critical system. And there's just no way to evaluate that ahead of time. So, Doom and Gloom. Did I achieve my mission? <laughs> Are you acutely aware of how fragile this whole socio-technical system really is? Well, have I got news for you? you know, I think there's a ton of potential. There's a ton of potential for us to work together in both scoping research questions as well as doing the outreach and providing information to researchers. And so when we do actively work with the ecosystems being studied, we're gonna have better outcomes. And better not meaning more positive, but better meaning more accurate and reflective of reality. Because we can't leave the witness here. But it also means that if we have better research, we can put research findings better into practice. I read a great paper um, last year about Dependabot and how to reduce cognitive load so that people found Dependabot alerts useful instead of noise. And I think that's a fantastic place where research and practice can come together to collaborate. We 
we need to make sure that we're not assuming things about identity, consent, or a priori knowledge, and to also not try to infer them. Inference about people, not a good idea. We've got plenty of counterexamples there. And we need to make sure that when we are publishing research, that we're considering the effects on the broader ecosystem. So look beyond the repository for factors that might influence your methodology and your findings. It's the Wild West. Out here in open source land, in open source data land, we're still figuring all this out. And science is also an ecosystem that's always in production. So we have to have a bit of empathy for both sides of the coin. But the best way to move forward is to work together. And it's really awesome because I see so many researchers who are newly interested in open source. And not just in a, hey, this is a cool test bit way, but in a, oh, I see the potential here and I want to contribute. And we see practitioners doing the same, just in the opposite direction. So I think that I think that if we can all agree on some like nice ground rules and understand that nobody has all the answers, you know, we're all making it up as we go along. We've got a lot of places we can make a lot of impact to make people's lives better. But as promised, references, if you want to read the whole paper, it's up there. It's got more formal language. Um, Build for scientists. And I just want to say thank you for having me. And I hope this wasn't too much of a downer. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. We need the warning labels. That's true. I should make sure to add those to yeah. the presentation. <laughs> May it cause intense suffering. How about just bummer? Bummer? Bummer. It's whimsical. <laughs> Whimsy. Does that have a place in open source? Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, we can just like read on my Twitter messages some more. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Do you want to take questions? We have a little bit of time. If, if people would like 